Just saw a big yawn. Mm -hmm. I thought he was trying to swallow the mic. Twenty Minute Tim's episode two hundred and ninety one. I'm your host Jamie, and I am joined by Stephen. Just about, just about. I'm here. And Martin Melly. I am here. And yet we are here. We are remotely back to the old school. We're not in the studio this week because Stephen, hilariously, now I know it's all serious and all that, but I, I'm pissing myself, Stephen, that you've got COVID. And uh, <laughs> the, the one week that you don't want COVID with yeah. the Glasgow Derby coming up, you have managed to catch it. And I did warn you about um, like indoor handles in public. Yeah, <laughs> this is the one thing I didn't want to happen. It's what one mm. of those has come back to bite me. But yeah, thanks for broadcasting my medical, my private medical uh, information on a, a podcast that goes out to millions. But just to let everyone know, all the screaming 20 maniacs worldwide, brother, I'm fine. I've taken mm. the best advice. Me and Lawrence Fox have been on the phone. <laughs> we're, we're handling it together. We're in, <laughs> we're in this ship together. We're both listening to Joe Rogan. We're fine. You listen to a lot of Joe Rogan when I put the tweet out to say <laughs> when I put the tweet out to say, listen, we're doing this remotely because one of the guys, I didn't say who, but I said one of the guys, I left that cliffhanger, you know, Stephen. I'm using your <laughs> using your life and your health to push uh, push podcast numbers up. I put out the tweet saying, Oh, blah, 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 we're doing it remotely because we have had a positive COVID test in the camp. Uh somebody tweeted us and went, You mean positive for flu? And I thought <laughs> <laughs> and I thought at five past nine this morning, I thought that's enough Twitter for me. Mm, on deadline yeah. day and I just wrapped it up look Melly Stephen's tested positive for Covid but I I've tested positive for battle fever oh I think we all have Jamie I think we all have it's a big one this week isn't it and now that the games are out the way we always say one game at a time even Celtic the manager players have all been saying it mm. no more games left it's the big boy on Wednesday it's it has been a week of difficult fixtures. We said it last week in the podcast that this week is probably make or break for the season. We went to Tynecastle, got a win there, but I think the the but the biggest result mainly in terms of like drama and shocks was was not only our result against Dundee United at Celtic Park, but that whole day of football, man. Yeah, it was class. We, we were just doing the they had the match before it and we, word came through halfway through the start of it that Rangers had dropped points we just presumed it was into extra time added time 3-2 Rangers or oh, that's that then we heard it was free each and then you looked around just around Celtic Park on the way in people the smile on their faces everybody's got that wee bit about them now and it was a massive opportunity for Celtic and for a while it looked like they weren't going to take it but the sweet relief and joy when we did My was God, absolutely yeah. tremendous that is what's been a football supporters all about that was so, oh, see if you could bottle that shit up on Saturday it would be worth a million well Mel in a sense we did bottle it because can I say that for very obvious reasons I wasn't there right so mm. I had to take in the At The Match podcast which is a podcast that is centred around the attending of games it's not just a match reaction it is it's basically a trip to Celtic Park with with us, essentially. There's the How do you listen to that, Stephen? How do, yeah. If someone's <laughs> listening to this podcast and quite fancy listening to immediate match reaction type podcasts from outside and towards the stadium, how would they listen to that? Brilliant. Fantastic question, James. I believe you find that over on patreon.com slash 20 minute Tims. But when I, uh, you, I get a wee peek behind the curtain here, you guys sent that to me in order to be produced and released while you were still at the game. And I, I got to listen to it as a package and I could hear you resigned to the fact that Rangers have snatched three mm. points away to Ross County and then you reacted to the goal going in live and people have been responding to that extremely well since listening to it so it was a fantastic little bit of drama on the At The Match podcast a wee bonus reaction because when we sat down Melly, it was like 90 plus 5 and we went right we'll just do this it's like on oh, Rangers have obviously and then I looked my phone buzzed and it was like the family group chat of all things my family group chat was like Rangers had dropped points and we were like, oh my God, this is it. But it all just like built up. It just seems like this whole week of football has been building towards the Glasgow Derby and that was just another element of it. You know, and that just piled the pressure and piled the drama on for the game that was going to come against Dundee United. But I mean, the Hearts game even was just about, you know, was it last Wednesday nearly a week ago now? That was a, that was a slog. That was a battle. You know, we, we romped it in the first half, but the second half we were really under the cosh. Yeah, we were up against it in the second half. The the goal sort of for Hearts came out of nothing, but once they got that, they were sort of in the ascendancy and Celtic just had to grind it out. And even 
got a bit of luck with the penalty miss hitting the post and basically going along the line behind Joe Hart and going out. And once we got that victory, like, do you know what? If we can grind out another one against Dundee United, it'll look good. And we're going into the Rangers game four points behind because realistically, did you expect Ross County, Malky Mackay's Ross County to get anything against well, Rangers? Hold on, hold on. You know? Jamie did say it was a tricky game. I did yeah, say, I did say uh, that on yeah, last week's podcast. I. Even still, Rangers managed to eke it out against Livingston last week uh, and they got the didn't get the result at the weekend. But it leaves us in a really good position now because if we had to go on into this at the start of the when we came back from the winter break, it was this game's must win for Celtic because we were six points behind and now we've cut it down to two points. It's not quite must win now, but the chance to go top of the league, oh, what a bonus that would be. What a week it's been, honestly. What a week it's been for the old Timdom for more mm. reasons than one. The, the two, obviously, great games. We've had a couple of debuts. Well, not yeah. not quite debut from Hatati, but Hatati basically announcing himself as a new superstar already, <laughs> joining the guys before him like Maeda and Kyogo and all that guys who have just come in and hit the ground running. Matt Riley has turned up and played pretty well against Hearts as well. So it's it's been exciting times, not not least because of, you know, there's no getting away from it. That Rangers result was massive as well. What a, what a boost to the confidence it was. And that made the afternoon even more dramatic because there was at points before, or during the did the United game when it didn't look when Celtic were going to do it, I thought Aye. this is potentially a disaster here. Not in terms of the the two points lost, it was just of what it would have said about the team, and you could yeah. see the headlines being written about bottling it again, passing up another opportunity to not gain ground at home and all that. And I was already reading those headlines in my mind and thinking, what an opportunity miss this is. And then he come up with that last minute goal, it, absolute scenes as the kids say. So it was that what, what an Aye. exciting week it's been, honestly. We, I, we were watching that Dundee night obviously you, you and I were at it Melly and just as the game went on the tension was building throughout the stadium and there was like a panic setting you're like we're going to we're going to fucking blow this we're going to mm, blow this yeah. opportunity because all the, the, the before the game there's a buzz about the place you're going into the stadium the team comes out there's a lot of changes, Melly, but there was there was a couple of guys that you thought we're going, we've got to be strong enough to see beyond Dundee United with this team yeah I thought so that you do sort of worry with Celtic right now when they make any sort of change, like Jota not starting, you're like, oh, Forrest and Abada, both aren't playing too great, despite one of them getting a goal here or there, Jackamakis as well. You're just not sure on it, and when you take that one bit of quality out, you, you do worry a bit, but still saying that, Atate and Matt O'Reilly in midfield, you thought, come on, like, right, let's see what they're doing. Two full-backs changed as well, so but not too much of a drop-off in quality there. So it, it was fine, but we still thought like Celtic just do the job. But the longer the game went on, the more worried you got. And it wasn't as if Celtic played terrible, but they just they weren't converting the chances they created. Their keeper was starting to make a lot of good saves. We weren't getting the slices of luck. And you know, perversely, when we were sitting there, Jamie, I, I kind of enjoyed it, man, because mm. see people the tension getting around you and everybody the wee moans and groans when there's over hit passes but at the same time when something happens the and there's a wee bit of silence the crowd gets going again and just urges the team on there was one point where the ball went out for a corner and Jota just started waving his hands and the crowd yeah. was going it just felt as if right the crowd's sort of sucking this ball into the net as something's <laughs> going to happen at some point and thank the Lord it did because the sweet relief of tension when it did <laughs> was up where the best feelings I've had in a long time. Uh, I'm I'm losing it here. I, and I'm just in the last couple of minutes, I, I struggled to hold it together. There, Melly's talking. Melly's talking about suck it off. Perversely enjoying the the tension yeah. around you. Sweet relief, <laughs> sucking the balls it. into the yeah. net. <laughs> Sorry, you can't you can't expect me to be an adult and maintain a straight face during that stuff there, but I'll I'll try and gather myself. But yes, a, a, a perverse tension surrounding the game. Mm. So let's see, the United as well. You've you've mentioned a couple of things that are familiar to us as well. Sigrist is always good. It seems like yeah. against Celtic, the the fact they've already been at Celtic Park this season and frustrated. I was at that game. Uh, that was around my birthday and. My family had kindly arranged for a wee bit of a day out for it and all that. So that was that ruined, the day of laughter and all that. Good, good signing. So I, I remember, I acutely remember what it was like to come away very frustrated from that game. So Dundee United have shown themselves to be capable of turning up to Celtic Park and getting a draw. So that, so that's what I, that kind of added to the heightened tension around the thing as well. And the, as, I, as I previously mentioned, me starting to read the negative headlines the following day and all that. So just incredible to get those those points as well because 
is it as much as we can talk about or we, we need to keep winning games and all that we simply do we absolutely have yeah. to because we've seen how easily the gap can be slashed just in the last couple of weeks and it's I think the main talking point that's going to come about the Rangers game is the selection. Who's going to play? Who can play? Who's going to be available to play? And, you know, there's a couple of players that there's going to be a bit of discussion about. I'm thinking of Matt O'Reilly. He came in, baptised my mm. fire right against Hearts, thrown right in. Thought he had a good, strong first half, faded away towards the end, ended up getting substituted. And I, I thought to myself, that boy knows he's been in a game here. What did you make of him against Dundee United? Do you think he's shown enough to maybe start against Rangers, Melly? Uh, well, I think he will because and look, I don't think it'd matter quite so much if he did show a lot against Dundee United because quite simply we don't have anybody else to play mm. but the Hearts game I thought it was really good I thought being playing for MK Dons in League One that he plays a lot of games they usually play two games a week with the amount of games they have but he admitted himself it was a step up a massive step up and it was a baptism of fire being thrown in at Tyne Castle and it's two games where in the previous games Celtic lost at Tyne Castle and drew with Dundee United at Celtic yeah, Park like Stephen yeah. said but this time around again we didn't have many options to change it but we got the results showing Celtic have come on a long way since those games and Matt O'Reilly sort of is part of that just coming into that team and slotting in seamlessly even like the runs he was making he was getting out wide and putting balls into the box he was creating a lot of chances he's only trained with the team a couple of days so he looked really good I thought it was a great Great first game for him, even though he did sort of just tire towards the end, but it's all looking rosy for him. Well, there was a stat that appeared on Sky, I think it maybe after 50 minutes or something like that, we he'd created eight chances in the game, mm. when the, the next nearest Celtic player was two. I think several players were on two and he'd created eight, including setting up the, the goal for Jack and Marcus. So that's that's an impressive debut by anyone's yep. you know, metric. That's that, that's a good contribution. Don't end, underestimate the the power of a good old fashioned adrenaline dump as well. See if you've been thrown into an atmosphere like that and you're not quite used to it. You're right, Melly. They do play a lot of probably really hard physical games in League One, but we've been thrown into an absolute cauldron of bile, <laughs> an absolute cauldron <laughs> of hatred with an atmosphere Pink like that. Never. <laughs> the, the first word that he said after the game was intense. That yeah. that was the first word he said. He said it's intense. So I can, I can fully understand that after all the excitement, after the, all the adrenaline of the first half, if that, if that wears off, you're probably going to end up absolutely shattered. And it kind of showed like that. But he's shown enough to me so far to look like he's a, a pretty shrewd buy again, to be honest. Again, look, we, we sign these players and the flow chart of a Celtic signing is is he under 23? Is he English? Has he come from a smaller club or has he come from like a youth setup? If yes, another project, mm. FFS, written all over Kerrydale Street and all that. But the guys just come in, made his debut hours, basically, or like a couple of days after signing, and looked as if he belonged in the team, at least. So I'm I'm pretty encouraged from what I've seen so far. So he's a nailed on. O'Reilly, he's he's playing against Rangers. I think his uh, midfield partner, Rio Hatati, I think he absolutely would be playing against Rangers as well, Melee. Uh, that goal against Hearts was an absolute spanker. <laughs> old Kit Kat wrists Craig Gordon back to the old days, man. Uh, it was an unbelievable strike. And I think if, you know, if he, he didn't need to help his case to be starting against Rangers, but I, I want to see him re reproduce a wee bit of that quality. Yeah, he was great. Again, the, the strike was unbelievable. When it goes through and he's running through, does it, I'm like, out to the left, out to the left. And before I'd even finished the sentence, it was past the keeper. <laughs> Uh, I know Craig Gordon's Craig, still diving by the time it hits the back <laughs> of the net. I know there's that great picture of him, and then there's a picture of Jota when with his hands in his head, and it's one of those where like you can look at the keeper, but it's going so fast. I don't, I don't think you can blame the keeper. And just that it was so satisfying to watch, and even after the game the next day, watched it so many times. It's just so satisfying. Just that, it just flies through the air and just hits the net and bounces back. It's just brilliant. And, that wee, sec that wee split second of a gap between the ball hitting the net and the Celtic fans celebrating as well. It was one of those ones that, wow, what a goal. Mm. It's interesting you should say that because you took the words out of my mouth about the way it hit the net because it, it didn't do that thing where the ball hits the net and rolls down onto the ground. Yeah. It hit the net and bounced back as if it had been <laughs> as if it had a trampoline or something like that. If such was the power of it. Yeah, Craig Gordon was never saving that. It just made it quite funny that... He went for it and it basically just went straight through his arms. Aye. But the ball was travelling at such a speed that he just couldn't close his arms quick enough, I don't think. It, it, you can see that he tries to 
either sort of palm the ball or punch it or just sort of get anything on it whatsoever. But by the time he's reacted, it's flown straight past him. So it's quite funny uh, seeing that from Craig Gordon because Craig Gordon's one of those guys who's, despite the immense success at Celtic, actually makes it quite easy to dislike him, doesn't he? I don't know. I I just, I I don't know. I just get the feeling like he never really took to being a Celtic player in some way. Mm. I could be completely wrong about that. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm I'm wrong. So, that's what I said. I I could be wrong about that. But there is just something about Craig Gordon. He's a bit of an outlier as far as that whole Celtic team goes. I just love seeing a goal whiz past him when he's playing for Hearts. It's great. It's Um, quite funny when he was spewing at Kyogo's goal earlier this season as well. when When he threw the ball at Edward after <laughs> the, that penalty as well so these things all add up see there's we we have I don't think we have telegraphed anything or has been as bang on about anything certainly this season as the the graph of bit on bullshit <laughs> we were absolutely bang on about it we said if you didn't listen to that podcast a couple of weeks ago we said the problem you're bit on is the more games you start them there's a graph where the chances of the bullshit from their bit on increases and this graph is reaching a crescendo just about the time the Rangers game lands and we started to see a little bit of bullshit. He got booked in the Hearts game, could have probably been off in the Hearts game eh, and done the United. We got the full bit on bullshit, Stephen. He got himself red carded, <laughs> so he's out. He's out of the Rangers game. Yeah, completely unsurprising. It's, uh, it's happened. Bit on bullshit klaxon. We have now wiped the whiteboard in the 20 MT office that says it has been such and such days since Beton's last bullshit. We've wiped that. It is zero. Um, so it's a difficult one because I do have a certain degree of sympathy with him. I think the first one, the first booking against the United, he commits a professional foul on mm. Tony Watt to stop them breaking after Anthony Ralston had an absolute shocker of a touch on the edge of the box which means the United break away was it necessary I, I don't know but I can understand why he tried to do something to halt that to try and get the ball back very quickly the second one there's a hint of a foul on Greg Taylor before yeah. it happens Greg Taylor's furious about it and then Beaton is the one who is punished because again he reacts to a situation that's already developing round about him when you probably would have expected a call from that so I, I do sympathise but what you're left with again is a total lack of shock that it has happened to near Beaton again mm. because there's such a track record for it how many times have we seen that beat on pose with the, the hands over the face as he is being sent off yet again for poor decision making? And again, I do I do want to make it clear that I do have that slight element of sympathy and that it probably wasn't entirely his fault. It wasn't like he just committed a utterly ridiculous, unjustifiable foul and get a straight red against Rangers or something like that, which he's done in the past. This was slightly mitigated, but at the end of the day, it is yet another one from their beat on that we're to talk about. He just carries a can for it. Yeah, I think so. He's not played since the winter break, apart from in these two games. And as you said, Jamie, the first one, he could have been sent off. He had the first book and then he had a wee handball. Right, job beaten didn't give him a red card, to be honest. But the second game he plays, you're like, calm down. Like The, the first booking is a definite booking, but it was... It's that one that's in between a yellow and a red card because it's it's so professional and it's so cynical. You're like, that is a wild challenge. And then when he knows he's on a booking, and said after the game, it's easy saying that from the comfy chairs. But at the same time, you're like, come on, mate. It's again getting caught wrong side or just being behind the ball that has caused them to get into these positions. And it's why... We, Again at the weekend, we really did miss Callum McGregor. There was times where you're wanting it, the ball to be moved a bit quicker. Mm. Beaton doesn't quite do that. And even in the Hearts game as well, Celtic did a slow start for the first 10, 15 minutes. And I felt it was because the defenders had too long on the ball. Now that's either down to the defenders or it's down to the players ahead of them not getting into the spaces to receive the ball. And I thought, felt Beaton was quite guilty in that. So mm. uh, we do miss Callum McGregor. It's not near Beaton's fault that he's not the same player, not as quick as Cal Maria, but it is his fault that he gets himself in silly positions time and time again. I mean, the, the Mitchelland one was an absolute disaster this season. It was so stupid. The, the book he got, <laughs> the first one, and uh, the second one even, where he slaps the guy, you're like, what are you doing? <laughs> this one as well, like, you're like oh, no. And it was, came at a time where Celtic were pressing and pressing, trying to get a goal, and for that to go down to 10 men, against a team who are playing very well defensively. You're like, ah, you could have just ruined this here. We had a chance here and you've maybe just blown it for us. But luckily, his uh, countrymen got him out of jail. It's, mm. it, he did. And 
I, th- I don't think there's any. There's there's no denying a bad eye anymore, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. You That's a great word for it. Yeah, there's, yeah, yeah. There's, there is no denying it because we've we've said on the podcast before. You know, he's maybe this his wing contribution isn't the best, and he's not really beating a man, but he's caught on up with goals and blah 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 blah. But there's just no argument anymore. That it was one. It was great game management by Ange, changing oh. the shape, putting a, a bad in. It wasn't by accident. No, you know, he came up with a plan and a way to try and win that game, and it came off. But secondly, that. Like, Abada's just turning up and turning up and turning up and he's putting in the effort and Ange said in the pre-match press conference <laughs> that we managed to go to, he said, you know, sometimes it's about your opportunity. Um, it's about taking that opportunity when it arises. And he said this in relation to a couple of players, but he, he singled out Abada. He goes, look, Abada's a young guy. He's 19. He's came from a different country, a different league. It's been difficult for him to settle, but he was called upon and he's taken his opportunity. And there's just... There's no stopping the guy. Turns up, go, assist, go, go, go. And then that one there, so important for us, so composed, great first touch, great finish. It was just, it, the, the wee guy is just worth his weight in gold. Well, I'm I'm no longer interested in any of the debating over a badder. You, you said it there, it's undeniable now with, with him. I'm not interested in the arguments over his ability, over his ability to do other things and whether he can only score goals, all, all that stuff. I've totally lost interest in it. Now, bear in mind, I'm one of the people who have been making that debate often yes. on this podcast. I've been, I've doubted him quite a bit during this time because he's, he's quite an odd player. There's no getting away from it. He's quite an odd player. Some of what he does looks quite awkward and he, he doesn't look like he's you know, suited to certain positions, but yet he plays in them. But all that said, I don't really care about it anymore because, see, to be honest, there's a tendency, and I, I don't want to get too into the weeds of this this argument and I don't want to like call anyone out, but there's a tendency to always want to be right about Celtic and about Celtic players and about what they're doing and about you know the system and all that sort of stuff. Mm. I, I, I don't have any fear in being wrong about players at Celtic. If, see if I'm wrong, I'll just change my mind. I'll just say, it, look, I'm wrong and move on. All I can do as a fan is ask questions of a player that I'm not convinced of and all that player can do is just shut me up and answer them, Aye. which is what, exactly what Abada has done. So I'm really glad that I'm totally wrong about him and he's continuing to perform. 12 goals is ridiculous for this stage of the season for a guy who I, well, I mean, I, I'm not alone in my doubt over him, but no. 12 goals, that huge important goal, and it's not the first important goal he scored as well. I, I simply have to just say <laughs> hats off to the guy, to be honest. I'm so glad that they've signed him because it, I can only see him getting better. We've had the discussion over whether he's better as a winger, as a striker. I still see him probably more as a central player. But the fact is, I don't care. He's he's turned out to be an absolutely brilliant signing and long may it continue. I think Stephen's right. There's definitely an argument, and we've spoken about it in the podcast before, where Abada's best position might end up. You know, he's, he's a young player. He's only 19, really. He could end up changing position as a striker. He's obviously got the option there. You know, he can play out in the wing and he can play through the middle. But there's there's just no denying the contribution that this guy's making to the Celtic team at the moment. Yeah, we've had the debate all season. Does he do enough? Does he do enough? But when you look at the other options, well, he's doing more than them. And yeah, the thing yeah. we have added is uh, he's a young guy with 19, maybe he's just turned 20 or whatever it yeah, is. He's, 20, yeah. he's he's contributing goals and, and that's quite rare for somebody so young. Usually you'll see young players and it'll be a no end product. They've got all the skill, all the pace, but they don't quite know what to do with it. It's the complete opposite with Abada. He doesn't quite have, he's got pace, he's got a bit of skill, but he doesn't quite know how to use it. But what he does do is he gets in positions and he finishes the composure on that one was brilliant. And for me, I've, I've had doubts over him. If he's going to play it wide, he has to do more in the sort of taking players on and skill wise. But for me, he plays because he kind of guarantees you goals. He will get into positions yeah. and score and that's rare for somebody so young. But it's also, right now it's vital for Celtic because we're, Going through a period where we've no Kyogo, Maeda's came in, done well, and then had to drop out. We have no Tom Rogic. The options up there are limited. And you see it with Abada. The goal against Allah was an absolute peach. The goal there at the weekend was so composed, a great finish and so vital for us. But he's getting it in positions and scoring. Well, that's crucial. Whereas you look to... Yeah. You look to James Forrest and go, ah, do you know what? He's been there and done it against... Well, he's not actually. He's been there and done it. <laughs> 
in other games, not Rangers games. So do you play him but with a bad It's just, look, he's got to play because there's a chance he'll score. The guy's high on confidence and you can't say the same for James Forrest right now. So a badder, he's in for me. So he's in against Rangers and the, you've, you've already came on to the next player that I think we need to talk about <laughs> is, is James Forrest. I think we've been we've been sort of sceptical about James Forrest for a couple of weeks on the podcast as well. It's a, it's a discussion that we've had about the age of the guy, what he's bringing to the team, what is how his game style sort of fits into what I'm just trying to do. And it's something that I mentioned pre-game on the, the podcast. I'm sure it's something that I was thinking anyway. I'm sure I mentioned it on the podcast. But I have a wee worry that we you hear a lot online about players not fitting Ange's system. Um, and for the most part, mm. I think that's not necessarily the case. Um, but one player that I do worry about fitting into Ange's system and fitting into the way that Ange likes to play is James Forrest. We are so quick at getting the ball forward and Abada gets it and he goes to that byline or he cuts in and he makes a chance. He's, he's very, very active. But through in the Dundee United game, one thing I did notice was you're talking about two or three touches max from our forward players a lot of the time. Take it, move it, take it, touch, move it. It's very, very quick until it goes to James Forrest. And James Forrest doesn't take the ball, or he doesn't run onto a ball or he doesn't take the ball and run quite often. What he does is he stands the ball up and waits for the defender to close mm. him and then tries to move by the defender. But he doesn't move in one movement. He goes touch, 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 touch. You know, it's you can picture the James Forrest style of playing your head. And by that time, I feel quite a lot of the good work we've done by being quick on the ball, by moving the ball forward, by pulling players and out of position. I feel like by the time the James Forrest gets the ball, it gives the, opp- the, the, the opposition a time to like, get back into shape. And I just don't think he's, he's not quick enough. He's, he, I just don't think he's quick enough of thought, quick enough of mind, quick enough to move the ball on. And I just worry what, what he can contribute to this Ange Postacoglu team. Well, it, it looks like he is struggling physically at the moment, but that's it's kind of understandable because he's been out for so long, but he has yeah. been back involved in the team for for you know, quite a while. But the fact is the last two seasons have been severely hampered by injuries for James Forrest. And you look further back in his career and he's had a few, he's had a few injuries and well, that, that has been scattered with really, really amazing seasons for Celtic. But the, my worry would be that those have caught up with him. And I'm not going to drag us back down the same discussion again because we've already did, had the, the chat about how, you know, by this time, a 30-year-old winger will yeah. decline. So almost, to, almost to a man, they will decline in terms of their physical output, in terms of their taking players on. That aside, it's the, it's the speed that I worry about when that goes, what else has James Forrest got? Now, that seems really, really harsh. I don't mean to imply that he's just simply a runner and he doesn't have any skill. That's not true at all. He's actually quite a good finisher and he's quite a good first-time passer. But all of that is held together by how fast he is on the pitch. Yeah. He's, he's, he's good movement. So I wonder if that's the kind of the, the card that will come away, that the house of cards will fall with James Forrest. I'm not willing to say that he's finished yet because I can see the... The familiar old cycle starting online, and we've been doing this long enough to to spot the hallmarks of it, because it's a very uncomfortable position for, or uncomfortable conversation rather for Celtic fans who are notoriously difficult to let go of a player when he starts to decline. I've seen it happen so many times now with Lustig, with Scott Brown, with guys who were on the decline, who were coming towards the end of their career, and no one's ever willing to admit when it's kind of over. I don't think we've reached that stage with James Forrest just yet, but it's an unpleasant conversation to have to enter into with a guy who's been here so long and you start to address the fact that he might not be the same player anymore because nobody really wants to hear it. Yeah, I don't even think it's so much as... I mean, I'm not really saying James Forrest is finished in football, but managers come, they bring their own styles, certain players can play in it, certain players adapt it, and sometimes the difficult decisions in football have to be made, and sometimes long-standing players who have had a lot of success and who still have something to offer some teams somewhere don't fit into the current manager's plans, and... I just look at Joe Hart. I, it's, a, it's an example we've had before. That's exactly what happened to him. So uh, it, it wasn't that he was finished. It was just that he didn't he didn't work for the the new manager anymore. And I think that's the vibe I'm getting with Forrest. And Ange said after the game, he wasn't too happy with the first half performance. That's why he made the changes at halftime. The two halftime changes he brought off Scales and Forrest, and brought on Jota and uh, Juranovic. And Jota is just leagues above James Forrest. Leagues above what James Forrest is offering us at the moment. Yeah, he definitely is. And we've seen it, the whole crowd got a lift. He was getting on the ball and crucially he was taking players on. And James Forrest was right in front of us at the game and uh, Saturday, Jamie, and you're just looking at him like, you're just 
a wee bit off from being able to pass the ball to why you're not dropping or making the run mm. to receive the ball when he's getting it he's he's not he's not being direct enough he's not being aggressive enough and but we know James Watt, that's the thing for me mm. I don't know if I made that clear because he was annoying me and it is just he's just far too ponderous on the ball like it takes him ages to make up his mind what he's going to do with it I think yeah, he does. And what Stephen said is true as well. Even going back, when was the last time James Forrest had a sustained run in the team where he was making significant contributions for Celtic? It's well over two years, given that look, we went 3-5-2 and then the pandemic hit and then he comes back, he gets injured for all last season. He's been injured most of this season. He's back in now. And it's when guys like Jota, Kyogo, all those guys come on and the, the levels are raised that Forrest, he's playing catch up. Same with guys like Mikey Johnson. They're playing catch up. They need to get this, these games. They need to get match fit, but they're not doing well in that. Confidence drops. And again, I think it's a, it's a confidence thing with James Forrest. And that's the problem with a bad. Well, that's not the problem with a bad. As a bad as getting goals, he's creating chances and he's taking them. Forrest isn't doing either. So he's not got that wee lift anywhere. And right now, again, we're short on options. So sometimes he has to play. And within that, he has to do better. I don't think he played well at all against Hearts either. So it's not as if it's one game. It's the games he's featured in since the break. He's not really done much and he's had a lot of opportunities within the game to do that. So it is a worry, but I'll not write him off because it, look, it has been a long time coming back. But <sighs> playing against Rangers, I think he'd be the one that would drop out for me. I think yeah. I think I think so. I think you've got to play I think playing Jota against Rangers is an absolute no brainer. And if we see the lineup come out against them and Jota's not on it, man, I would be tearing my hair out. I think yeah, uh, the, the only options really are Jota Abada and Jakimakis or Jota Abada and Forrest. So it's a straight choice between Jota, eh, between Forrest and Jakimakis for me. And mm, Jakimakis yeah. has scored a couple of games since he's come back. Forrest has got one goal against St. Johnson months ago and he's not kicked on at all since then. Uh, you, you touched on him there, Melly. I mean, I've been sort of saying I've, I've got confidence in Jakimakis. Um, I feel like he could be you know, a wee Samara Sunday, one of these guys that sort of puts on a real good show for us against Rangers. But I just, I think he's a guy that maybe I've got more confidence in Jackie Marcus than Jackie Marcus has in himself because <laughs> he, he looked as if his head started to go down. There was a, he had a shot and uh, Seagrass pulled off a great save with his leg, like a flailing leg, managed to save it. I'm sure it was his leg. And then there was the one where he completely mishit the shot from inside the box as well. Yeah. And he, he, he put his head in his hands and he's sort of collapsed onto the ground. And you think to yourself, no, nah, man, if this, yeah, is going to work, if this is going to work for you, you need to be confident in your own ability. We can't go into the Rangers game with Jack and Marcus bricking it, Stephen. <laughs> well, well, it's funny you should say that because how he acts on the pitch is completely at odds with how Ange bums him up in the press because you know, any time anything related. is asked you think that's why yeah of course I, any, anytime anything is asked of uh, Jackie Marcus you know will that girl take the burden off him will that give him confidence and in his own you know style that we've all become accustomed to basically sweeps all that away and says well oh, he's not he's not going to treat it as a burden he's a Celtic centre forward you know and this is what they do etc but it's when he goes out on the pitch Nothing can be further from the truth. It, it does look like he's carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders at times. But uh, see the see the save that you're talking about, Jamie, that Sigrist made with his feet? Mm. It was actually off target. Yeah. There's an angle from behind the goal that shows it wasn't going in. Oh, so maybe, so he's probably got on his, his own case about that as well. Uh, see, Giacomacus is a funny one. I think he's done all right. And it's impossible to deny that he's scored like three goals and probably four or five starts for Celtic now, which is good. Um, but... Again, you have to be a wee bit more, maybe a wee bit more objective than that and just look at his performances rather than just the goals themselves. Because he, with the exception of Bangura, and that's not a comparison I'm bleeping to you, with the exception of Bangura, pretty much every dud Celtic striker has scored goals mm. at the start and then just kind of fallen off. Klamala, Amido Baldi. Amido Baldi got about five, did they know, or something ridiculous like that? Chris Killen. It's because we'll always create Again, chances for these guys, isn't it? It's because... Yeah, exactly. So I, and I'm not comparing them to those guys. I'm just saying that the goals aren't really the full story. No. It's just that I, I look at his play and I think, well, I'm, I'm not, really, not really sure about it because some of the chances he snatches at, some of the chances he doesn't have to think about, he just sticks them away. Like really good finishes. The one against Alawa, the one against the wee bit of improvisation against Hearts. All his goals are really good, mm. but the minute he has to think about it, he just totally fluffs his lines. But see, having said that, I'm really trying not to overanalyze it because 
I, I'm not really that bothered because like, from what I was saying about Abada, Abada's not only answering questions from me about himself, he's kind of shutting down questions about other players because I think there's less of a requirement for Jackie Marcus to be anything other than what he is just now because Abada's been so good and he's weighing in with goals. I'd be quite happy to play Abada through the middle if Jackie Marcus can't make it for whatever reason in one game or other. But yeah, not everyone can be Kyogo or Edward or something like that. See if Jackie Marcus is just a guy who's going to come in every so often and he's going to get you 10, 12 goals a season. I think that's fine. It's just unfortunate right now that he's the only one available in that position, which has created a, a greater scrutiny on him. But do you have confidence Otherwise, for the Rangers game? I suppose that, because that's, that's, uh, that's, that's the big question. I mean, all eyes are on the Rangers game and whilst the big picture might be that I could come in 12 goals a season or that, but if those 12 goals are against yeah, Alawa, yeah. St Mirren, Ross County, if he does the old Chris Boyd thing where he weighs in with goals when your team are already winning 3 and 4 now. Yeah, these teams need scored against as well, of course. So you you do need goals against these lesser teams, but you're absolutely right. The the matter at hand here is whether I can see him scoring against Rangers. I probably, I think I probably can, given the right circumstances created for him. I, again, I'm not writing this guy off at all. I'm just I'm just curious about him a little bit. I just I don't know. I'm not concerned about the chat about how he doesn't fit into the system because I think every team needs different options. Uh, I don't really see what would be the point in having a Kyogo and then a Kyogo clone behind him well, because I, that's basically I, just the, about the same thing. The Ange's system and all that. I wonder how <coughs> close to Ange's, quote, Ange's system, the, the team that finished and won the Dundee United game was. <laughs> yeah. Probably, yeah, Ange's right. probably never envisaged that team in his puff, but he just made it yeah, We've had that debate as well. I think the whole Ange's system, Ange ball stuff is largely bollocks. I think it's just a, a label that people like to throw around for when it's fun, but when it's been applied incorrectly, I, I find it quite tedious. Mm. But this player doesn't fit it. Ultimately, the system is whatever gets the game won on any particular day. It's not a rigid formula to play every single game with. But it, my, my point about Jackie Marcus is that we need we need different options. You know, you need someone who's different from Kyogo, who's different from Abada, who's different from James Forrest, a, a different type of striker in there that you can turn to. So I'm I'm happy that he's around, but I just I remain to be fully convinced by his his overall ability. To be honest, I don't want to come across as too harsh because he is scoring goals, but I'd quite like to quite like to see a wee bit more from him. Melly, confidence in Jakob Eh, uh, I think so. <coughs> Again, like Stephen, it's a strange one. I think he works really well on instinct. When there's an early ball across and he's in at the front post, I think that's ideal for him. That's where most of his goals have come from. And the was it St John uh, Ross County even uh, Aloha and the Hearts game. It's all sort of near post, and he does put himself about in a good way. He makes it doesn't make it easy for the centre backs he's up against. They gave John Suter a good game. He does drop deep, hold it up, and bring other players into the game. And as well, he drops deep and wins fouls for Celtic. He does like getting yeah, those yeah. touches in the back and he'll go down, sort of take the pressure off or put the pressure on the other team if we manage to keep the ball up there. So he's good in that way. But like Stephen, it's just as soon as he's got a second to think about it, I think he's just not making up his mind quick enough. He's hesitating. He's just He just doesn't take those chances. I don't think he's ever going to be clinical for Celtic I think he will be a guy who feeds off confidence so if he scores in one game he'll think he can score in the next game if he doesn't score in a game he'll sort of be worried about the next game and look when he dropped down his knees at the weekend there's like oh, you, you can't be acting like that there's plenty yeah. of time in the game there's going to be more opportunities and I was a wee bit worried when Ange took him off but at the same time it worked out well because leaving a bad on there it was more legs than uh, Jack Amakis could have gave us and I, I was just a wee bit worried for him. But at the same time, I think he can do a lot of good things against Rangers. Like I said, I think he will give the two centre-halves a tough time. Oh, if there's that's... set pieces at Alan McGregor as well, we've seen he's had a yeah. few clangers at the weekend. Calvin Bassey made a mistake back there. So the Rangers' defence won't be in huge confidence in having a guy up there alongside Jota and Abada. We know what they can do. Jack Amakis will give you that physical edge. Abada will finish any chances and Jota will skin you and take you on if you give him any opportunity and he can score and set up goals like he did at the weekend there. So there is strengths to that front three, but there is doubts as well. Agrees his birthday today, of course, guys. Oh. The big 4 0. Yet yeah, again, he's turned 40 again. So yeah, many Life happy returns. begins to... at 40, Alan. Just out there on the pitch, just <laughs> working shit out, just having meltdowns week in, <laughs> week out on the pitch. Midlife crisis, that's what it'll be. 
This podcast is sponsored by Manscaped. Now listen, Cubid works hard in February, but our friends at Manscaped are working even harder to ensure that your Valentine's Day is one to remember. Don't turn this day of romance into Independence Day this year and get in control with our Performance Package 4.0, which includes our signature lawnmower 4.0. This February, join the 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped. Now we have an exclusive offer for you. Go to manscaped.com and insert code TIMS for 20% off. That's not unsubstantial. And free shipping contrary to popular belief love is not blind especially when you can't see it past a love jungle that is the copy we were given i apologize this package also includes the weed whacker which is a nose and ear hair trimmer to whack the worst of your weed so it's not just below the waist grooming it's above the waist grooming an area that's often overlooked manscaped even threw in two other free gifts their shed travel bag and a pair of their anti-chafing boxer briefs to keep your boys cool and collected that whole package 20 percent off and free shipping manscaped.com use code tims look if you would like a more tactical focused preview of the rangers game we have had rangers scouted um we got in touch with the professional scout who has previewed the rangers game for us he talks about how rangers are going to approach how they defend how they attack how we can hurt them how they might potentially hurt us we discuss the key players on both sides that could make the difference all from a sort of tactical slash scouting point of view that will be available um on patreon.com slash 20 minute times look out for that um that's really good and interesting thing we do for a lot of these games um so I think we're pretty much going to be stuck with Yakimakis up front anyway. I think any talk of Maeda coming back, Kyogo yeah. coming back, just really isn't really isn't going to happen. I think Bitton is out. I think the straight replacement in the Erd Melee is probably James McCarthy. Yeah, it will be, won't it? It's very likely. And I, I don't know. I, I still think we, we always speak about near Bitton's nonsense and I don't know if you get that from McCarthy. He seems quite a level-headed on the pitch when he's come on. He's come on and sort of seen games out for Celtic. He'd done it against Alwa. Didn't quite need it, but he just brought a wee bit of calmness in there that we missed without Cal McGregor. I feel he'd done that against Hearts. I thought he could have came on a wee bit earlier. And at the weekend, him and uh, O'Reilly sat there in midfield and allowed Jota, Doak and Abada to do the rest. So, I think he will give us that wee bit of calmness in there. I don't think McCarthy will be too phased by the game. And when your options are McCarthy or Sorrow, McCarthy will bring a calm presence. I don't think we'll get much nonsense from him. It's just the fitness thing we worry about. Whereas Sorrow, you're like, well, you're going to yeah. get sent off at some point as well. So, <laughs> also, we need, uh, we need to factor in the fact that these are the games McCarthy came up for. Celtic fan, grew up yeah. here. He knows all about these games. He'll be chomping at the bit to take part. And again, given his opportunity. And you're right, he is a leader on the pitch. I think that's something that's going unnoticed, especially during the Dundee United game. You see him pointing a lot, giving directions, telling people where to go. And he's always asking for the ball. And again, I think it's one of these ones a bit like Starfield when he first came in people sort of turned against him uh, and, they're, and they're not prepared to really give him the time of day and although we haven't really seen much of him I think that the wee cameos he's shown he, he has prov- he has proven rather to be that sort of calm, level-headed more experienced midfielder that, that we really probably need in this Rangers game Stephen uh, You're saying he gets it You're saying James McCarthy hashtag he gets it up he? here He knows what it takes I mean see I'm joking aside James McCarthy played in as long as as much as he's been away for a long time he played in Scotland for a long time he's a lifelong Celtic fan and has spent the last decade being booed and abused for his national team choices very few people are more qualified to hashtag get it in this country than James McCarthy so yeah I've no fears about him going into this game whatsoever it's weird in a way that James McCarthy has come in with this I mean arguably in terms of stature in terms of what where where he's been in the game and all that the biggest signing Celtic made in in the last year or so and yet he's kind of just dwindled away to this sort of almost joke figure that pops on every so often and people just sort of groan at him so I I still think there's something to come from James McCarthy he has had poor games but since then you're right to compare it to Starfield it's like it's almost like just the first impressions have stuck and I think he's been largely fine recently so I've got no no qualms about toss him into this game whatsoever I think he'll be absolutely fine I don't think he'll be as Melly put it I don't think he'll be phased by that whatsoever so no I think James McCarthy's a, a no-brainer for that position So we all pretty much sound on a badder Jackamakis and Jota up top I think it has to be Yeah, yeah, yeah sounds good Alright, say we're in the game things are getting a bit stretched we need to make a change up there do you bring on James Forrest or do you bring on Ben Doak? Oh, well that's a tricky one indeed Ben Doak 
looked up for it. Looked yeah. very direct as you know, as a sixteen year old is going. He's he's going to be bounding after it like a dog chasing a ball down the stairs. So he's he looked good. He looked up for I it. I asked him into it. So I thought Doak when he came on. I thought he deserved a mention because tough ass coming on in that game to make your debut in a game where the crowd is baying for a victory because of what what's at stake and he comes on I thought he wanted to get on the ball I thought he showed no fear and when he did get on the ball he was trying to take players on and I think he was doing that he did give the left back a bit of torrid time and then when we went down to the 10 men he had to Celtic went 4-3-2 and he had to go up front with Abada it's very difficult but he still kept playing the game and he went for them so just looking at the total difference between him and Forrest, a, a boy on confidence, ready to take players on. In the same game, I've seen the complete opposite from James Forrest and I don't see why being experienced again in big games is going to change that for him on Wednesday night because he can't do it against Dundee United. Why all of a sudden is he just going to do it against Rangers? Maybe he can draw on his experience, but I can't think of a player who's been at Celtic for such a long yeah, time yeah, who's I mean, had that, so many poor games against him. So I think the players, more or less, they're going to pick themselves based on who who we've got available. Um, it is transfer deadline day, so we might bring someone else in. We kind of know how Rangers are going to shape up, although they have made, <laughs> what, what, on the face of it, could be a genuinely astonishing transfer. Um, it's still no, it's still not signed, sealed and delivered. Um, that Fabrizio Romano, um, the guy who sold his soul to the devil to become the knowledge of all, font of knowledge of every transfer in the world has more or less yeah. said done deal. Um, I don't know how this guy knows so much about transfers, but he does. So it's it, he says that Rangers have more or less signed the deal for Juventus midfielder Aaron Ramsey, which is, you know, we're, we're not too big to admit. It doesn't even happen in football manager. Yeah, man. it's, it's, <laughs> we're, we're big enough to admit that that's a bit of a coup for Rangers. Now, the, the one thing I said, right, the guy has hardly played any football in such a long time. And as we're recording this, um, you actually touched on something, Melly. You said when O'Reilly signed for us, you enjoy reading the comments from the, the the fans of the team that he's leaving to see what they're saying. Good luck and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, sorry to see you go. And that's, that was the, the vibe when O'Reilly left. Uh, I'm doing the same at the moment for Aaron Ramsey. Uh, leave Juventus. We've had enough of you. Piss off is one... <laughs> Are you proud of yourself asking a club <laughs> who doesn't want you anymore? Please leave. Where is your honour? Uh, Marco Tercetti said, eh, years stealing a salary. You should be ashamed of yourself. You should be ashamed. You're an absolute scandalous footballer. Uh, uh, Nicola Roberto says, care to play for UV as well? Or should we ask Wales to pay your miserable salary? Wales isn't rich enough. Doubt they can afford you, you dirty, rotten, little useless dwarf. <laughs> <laughs> you barely <laughs> twat uh, this other guy said red like a clown that you are leave Juventus now uh, and a lot of shit emojis have been posted followed by Italian so I don't I don't. useless clown leave Juventus sheep nose gimp yeah blood nose <laughs> gimp it's, so the, the Juventus fans are absolutely buzzing that this guy's going so take from that what you will but it's a it's it's probably too soon for him to play against us but it's a striking piece of business well, he's not played for anyone since November. He played a couple of ninety minutes for Wales, and I think he's been he's been outstanding for Wales from what I can gather in their qualifying campaign of late. You know, he's barely played for Juventus for a while, but I mean, see as much as we can talk about the fans wanting him out the club and all, it is still Juventus. What yeah, we're talking about yeah. here, but I mean, if MK Don's fans were chasing Matt O'Reilly out the door, saying he was terrible and a fraud and all that, I'd be concerned about that. But Juventus are one of the best and biggest clubs in the in the entire world, and they just don't want this guy anymore. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not happy about it, but I'm trying to be a grown up about it. Is Aaron Ramsey? After all, two years ago, he won Serie A with Juventus while being probably the seventh or eighth highest paid footballer in the world. <laughs> And now Rangers have got yeah. him in his in his squad in their squad rather, so it's it's not it's not nothing. It's it's a astonishing transfer. Even if you leave aside the the fact that he might not play, he might be dead, you're injury prone, he might you know never contribute anything. But the fact that Rangers have signed Aaron Ramsey, make no mistake, is a jaw dropping transfer. Maybe. Not I'm not talking about pieces of business and all that that. Terminal, weird terminology people throw about but the fact of saying them is unbelievable they have uh, went all in on this transfer that's what I think I think they've went all in on this transfer they know they need to win and they've went they've went big they've went box office they've probably spent their entire year's transfer budget every penny that's left has went on 
Aaron Ramsey to pay whatever they've had to pay to get him in the door. Questions over Aaron Ramsey. For me, there's questions over Aaron Ramsey. I'm not like being obtuse about it and all, saying, oh, it's a Rangers player, he's definitely shite. But, you know, Aaron Ramsey, I remember when he was leaving Arsenal, supposedly had offers for to go to Barcelona, Real Madrid with Gareth Bale, ended up at Juventus, who were a massive team at the time. And now he's on loan for Rangers. So you're thinking, there couldn't have been many people champing the door down to get Aaron Ramsey's signature. But he's, you know, I'm not being deliberately obtuse, I'm just saying it's, there is perspective here. And I wonder how much of the old Aaron Ramsey um, we will ever see in a Rangers shirt. But are you worried, Melly? Uh, yeah, to be honest, when I seen it first thing this morning, I thought there's no way that's happening. Like, even if they spent a tenth for his wages, that's still at 40 grand. So I just didn't see it happen. Uh, Talk Sports said they were getting all of it. I <laughs> Strangers are willing to pay all of it. 400, 400 grand a week. Aye, okay. But it, it seems to be that Juventus were pretty much willing to do anything to get him out. And it doesn't really make a difference to me about whether Juve want him out or not. The thing for me is... If Aaron Ramsey plays, will he be a good player? And if he does, like, he should piss this league. He should mm, absolutely yeah. piss it. If you're looking ahead to the game on Wednesday or even for the rest of the season, I think Rangers started with Kamara, Arfield and Aribo at the weekend as a free in midfield. I think Celtic can take that and they'll probably drop points for the rest of the season. If you add Aaron, I know him being fit is a very big if, but Aaron Ramsey... Kamara and Aribo that is a very very good midfield and this time last week we were delighted with Matt O'Reilly I think he's been good but Aaron Ramsey coming in kind of changes things I know the the whole fitness issue but even if he plays for them he should do very well he always plays well for Wales when he's called upon so maybe it's just he needs something new I just I hope he's not good for them, man, because if he is, he could be a bit of a sensation, to be honest. I hope he's the next Seb Rosenthal. That's what I hope, Stephen. Oh. <laughs> Daniel Prodan. Next Daniel Prodan. Hey, I have laughed at some of the, the various stages of grief and denial online because everyone started the day saying, oh, this is a lot of pish. There's no way they're going to get him in. And then from there, it changed to things like, well, where, where are they going to fit him in? Are they going to drop our field? Aye, aye, they're going to drop our field, guys. <laughs> I don't think it really matters who plays he takes. He's Aaron Ramsey. But I, I, I don't think we can necessarily be fearful of it. But at the same time, I'm not going to sit here and say Aaron Ramsey's a bad or a panic signing for Rangers. I think that's ridiculous. That he's a, he is, the caveat being, if he stays fit, mm. He walks into that team as comfortably the best player in it. So I, oh, I don't think it's really a case of, oh, you know, it might upset it might upset Scotty Arfield. Scott Arfield will be polishing <laughs> Ramsey's boots by the end of the season if Aaron Ramsey <laughs> plays uh, plays the exactly. he's, 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 he's he has played in the past. It's weird these Arsenal players because it's like him and Wilshire and there was like a wee cluster of them. They all came out of like Arsenal, but they all came out more or less crocked from, mm, from yeah. quite Diaby. Diaby's another one from quite a young age. So Thomas Rossicky, although he was quite established before he joined us, but he was an element absolutely yeah. plagued with plagued by injuries. So there's look, it's it's a very, very tense game that it's going to be. But I, he, here's here's where I sit on it. We we have to win it. It's there's mm, so yeah. many reasons why we have to win this game of football. We have to win it because Ange needs to win against Rangers. He needs that. The first game came too early for, for us. We all said that, even at the time, that's not an excuse. The first Glasgow Derby, we said probably a wee bit too early for Celtic at the moment and Ange's team. This one's come around. I we've plagued with injuries and we've got our captain's missing and Kyogo's missing and all the uh, Maeda's going to be missing. We're, we're really no up to full strength. But the, I kind of feel like excuses just have to go out the window now and we just have to win this game. Uh, it's mm. something that I've said before. It's It's been long past time. We've beaten Rangers. We've not beaten them since when that 2019, Melly. That uh, it would have been that, September, uh, September that cup final that's ridiculous it's embarrassing and it's there's no excuses we need to find a way to win this team and uh, Aaron Ramsey or no Aaron Ramsey I think we've got the players available at our disposal to beat Rangers and I think Ange has got the ability to come up with a, a plan and a game plan and a way of playing to do it so I'm really not going to accept anything less than a victory on Wednesday night however mm. I think it's going to be a draw. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not mm. sure it's quite a must win for me. I think it's a must not lose. And if we if we draw the Would game, you take two Rangers again. I, I, I'm talking. I'm not just talking about how it stands for this league. I'm talking about how the whole everything that feeds into these games. It's not just another league game. You know, oh well, okay, we'll be two points behind or one point ahead. I'm talking about 
the, your biggest rivals, the Glasgow, you have to get one over on them eventually. You can't just accept a draw, surely. No, but that's that's taken into context the last three years, whereas Ange Postacoglu's come in this season, played them once and probably could have got a draw out of it, even though we were heavy under strength and changed a lot right at the start of the season. I'm not going to take into consideration last season or the season before because like, the game is we're going into it two points behind. A couple of weeks ago, it was must win because we were six points behind. Would I love to beat them? Of course, I think it could give us a massive springboard, but at the same time, not winning the game leaves us two points behind with a better goal difference in Rangers. So all it takes is for them to drop points and then we're right back on top again. So drop points I guess too. I, if we can't beat them, why would we expect them to beat them? Two points in the last three league games and the only the other league game they scraped through against Livingston. I think you're way off here, mate. I think you're 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 I think, points, I, think, I think I think he's getting his excuses in, Stephen. I think he's getting his excuses in before the game kicks off. Get up, baby toads oh. anyway. <laughs> don't, don't talk about melee like that. Yeah. I didn't mean I didn't want you to <laughs> foot him, Stephen. <laughs> Absolutely get it. Speaking of two footers, show Aaron Ramsey a picture of Ryan Shawcross and he'll shake himself. Bang. Get him get him playing in Livingston. Yeah, absolutely get it up the wee get Ryan Shawcross I, I that respect. My, my respect began and ended by saying that they'd signed a big player. That's it. I'm drawing the line there. <laughs> absolutely get it up them. We need we do we do need to go out and beat them. It's not the end of the world if we don't, of course not, right? But as I said about the, the United game earlier more than the points matters in these cases what I said about Dundee United was that uh, look what that does psychologically if we fail to do this again Rangers have presented us with this chance and we've failed it yet again but they didn't do that they went out and won but what my point is that think how much of a psychological blow we can land by finally beating them look we've we've been down for the last two seasons we've been absolutely mm. pathetic last season we've getting gubbed off from left and right they finally turned the tides and keep beating us we finally just come back and get that victory and setting us up for the rest of the season, get the new players fully integrated. That's kind of how I'm looking at That's it. That's how I'm looking at it as well. He's got skills yeah. in his ass. I mean, I think a draw would be fine, but oh man, how how good would a win be I, at this stage look, of the season? The reason I'm saying a draw is because all of our wins as of late have been quite close. We've won the majority of the games by an, the odd goal here and there. So, uh, uh, you know, up until very recently, I was still predicting, you know, Celtic would go and blow Rangers away, win 3 0, win 4 0, 3 1, all this sort of stuff. I don't think it's going to be that sort of game. I can see Rangers scoring, I can definitely see us scoring but I can't see us scoring maybe more than one or two goals. So in my head, we're looking at a narrow victory or a draw, but I, would, I wouldn't I would accept a draw because I think, like you say, everything that plays into this game, Stephen, all the seasons and seasons, like it's almost felt like a light switch to me. You know, someone flicked a switch where we used to batter Rangers without even thinking about it. We would turn up and just blow them away. And somewhere in the last couple of years, someone flicked a switch and we just don't beat them anymore. And it's not yeah. even like one, one we beat them once, they beat us once. It's just we've stopped beating Rangers and that needs to come yeah. to an end. And I know, you know, Ange isn't responsible for what happened a couple of years ago, but the weight of these fixtures and the weight of these results, that's what a rivalry is. It, you, you, it's the weight of everything that's going on. It's getting one over on your opponent. So it's not just like, oh, we lost this individual game, but in the grand scheme of the league, it doesn't matter. It's, we need to right this wrong. We really do. Yeah, look, I'm desperate to beat them. I think Celtic can, and like you, I think it will be a tight game. Probably won by the odd goal, if if even that. But I don't think it's a, a, a must win for Celtic. Maybe it is for the fans, but I wouldn't say for the team or the manager. They'll be going in and saying, we have to win this. So what difference will it make if they don't win it? They'll still be in the same position. They'll still have another game against Rangers. Yes, at some point we will have to beat them if we're going to win the league. Mm -hmm. I just don't see right now two points behind why it has to happen on Wednesday night. I would love it to, but it's not going to be the end of the world if we come away from a draw for me because we're coming back with Kyogo, Maeda, Rogic, all these players coming back, Callum McGregor, our captain, it's a big ask for Celtic to go into this game without all those guys. Yeah, but if we, if we draw at home, um, it, it stands to reason that we might get beat at Ibrox. So I, I, I just, I know, I know, yeah, I, we can beat them in the next game. As I well. know what you're getting at. You know, and said that himself. You don't hand out trophies. There's nothing to be gained for being top of the league. But and I'm not saying it's a must win or all bets are off. What I'm saying is, out with the terms of the league. We we just have to beat them. We have to put an end to this, this torrid and horrible run of Rangers teams beating us even shite Rangers teams I don't think the team that beat us 1-0 earlier on in the season ran over the top of us 
I just think they, no, they, they got us at the right moment in time and managed to get away with a goal. I think looking at their team, Bassey at the centre of defence, I don't think he's up to much. He's not even a really a mm-hmm. centre half. Alan McGregor, just off the back of a couple of howlers, that guy's just a, a walking disaster. In fact, I, I do wonder if he'll even start. Uh, Morelos, they don't have him, who's by far and away their best striker. And although he's not got the best scoring record against us, does cause us problems. That guy, Itton, is absolutely rotten. Kmar Roof is okay. Ryan Kent loses the rag against us, kind of keep his cool, but he is dangerous. I think looking at the Rangers team and looking at the Celtic team, it's, it's, it's they're, they're quite closely matched, but there are different areas we can hurt them. Yeah, there definitely is. And look, their defence hasn't been doing well of late. They look like they can, can concede goals and they gave away very silly goals at the weekend. But let's not forget, like yes, Celtic haven't beat them since 2019. That's fine. It's only six games in there. Five of them were last season. We had a massive, massive gap because of COVID where there was no games and we were due to play them and to be honest we'd have absolutely scalped them at Ibrox if we had to play it that weekend so yes I want this run over I want to beat them but it's kind of tainted out. Well, not tainted but it's you need to look at a wee bit of a bigger picture for me I think we, we can hurt Rangers we've got the players out wide and up front to do that the battle is going to be for me in the midfield Hatate, O'Reilly and McCarthy up against probably our field Kamara and Aribo, that'll be the, the interesting one for me. These games are usually tight. They're usually one in the midfield battle and it's it's time to see what Celtic are made of in there. I think that's it. I think that's it, Stephen. I think these, in many ways, or in w- one, rather not in many ways, but in one specific way, a lot of the time, these are the games that really matter. These are the ones where you're up against your biggest rival, up against the, the best team in the country. This is where you really test yourself. These are the, the yardstick. It's that, that famous line, Rangers are the benchmark. And that's kind of how I feel about it. Let's get let's get them tested. Let's see how Angie's team shapes up. Yeah, no, there's no getting away from that. I think, to be honest, as much as you're debating it, I think I agree with both of you. Uh, I think we, we do need to address this thing. We, do, we simply do need to beat Rangers at some point, but it's not, it's, it's not the end of the world if we don't win this. The circumstances of the game will hugely dictate how we feel about it because it's all very well sitting here just now and saying ah, a draw would be fine but if we absolutely dominate that game oh, right. pin them back for the entire team hit the post and McGregor's making saves and all that and we come away with a draw we're not going to be sitting here going uh, do you know what it's fine mm-hmm. we'll beat them the next time we're going to be raging about it so again there's only so much we can put into it at this point but my main feeling is uh, let's just go and beat them, man. Please, yeah. please let's just go and beat them because I'm really desperate for it at this point. It's been far, far, far too long. But too long, um, baby. Yeah, <laughs> too long, baby. Um, I'm confident, though, it's it's going to be difficult. I, I wouldn't be churlish enough to sit here and deny that they are top of the league as much as they've been cutting it away and they've been looking like they've been losing confidence. They've had a, had a wee bit of wobble since losing their manager. And... They had that brief kind of new manager bounce, but now look as if they're off the tail end of that and starting to falter a wee bit. Ultimately, they're still top of the league and we've no earned the right to, to treat this as, a, as any kind of walkover. So simply need to go out there and prove that Celtic belong back at the top table again and need to, need to put a few things right I think here. that's what Andrew want. I know he's playing it down in the press. We're at the pre-match press conference. That's on Zoom tomorrow. <laughs> we'll be putting our questions to Ange and a player, whoever that player might be. It'd be nice if the BBC wouldn't steal our question this time and put it out uncredited <laughs> as they did as they did last week. Um, but I, I know Ange is very level-headed and all that sort of stuff, but I think behind the scenes, he'll be firing brimstone. He'll be Whoa. he'll be at it you know, all week. He'll get the players riled up. They'll be ready to run through walls for the guy. And I think, you know how sometimes managers save these like special team talks for, for big games, you know, and every footballer that's had a great manager even the likes of some of the guys that played for Neil Lennon famously Alex Ferguson they always talk about oh, that team talk you gave in this specific game at, I think the Martin O'Neill at Liverpool yeah, think, yeah, yeah things yeah. like that I think I think Ange's probably got one of those up his sleeve because I think he'll no be happy knowing that Celtic are the second best team in Scotland still what? he'll no be happy that's no good enough for Ange Postacoglu and if he wants to win this league he needs to leave a mark on the champions and I, I, I think that's exactly what what we're shaping up to do I just wish we had uh, I just wish we had our players back I just do I just wish we had McGregor on that pitch I wish we had Kyogo I wish we had Maeda because those three players doesn't matter what team takes to the pitch on Wednesday those three players they change the whole complexion of the Celtic team even Rogic and Rogic, Turnbull and guys like yeah, that as well geez, you know? man so it's I just feel this game might have come at the wrong time for Rangers but Ange won't be making excuses for his side and I don't think I'll be 
I'll, I'm ready to make excuses. Wrong time for Celtic? Yeah, wrong time for Celtic rather. Did I say Rangers there? Yes. Ah, right. Wrong time for Celtic. I think this game has come at the wrong time. But do you know what? There's always something. And there? there's always something. Yeah. So, and I don't think Ange will be making excuses. And I, I've got faith that Ange can get a victory out the bag. Whew, close game. It's, as we say, as we record this, it is transfer deadline. Now, Celtic have not made any business today. There was rumours that we were after a left back from Derby County. Um, those sort of seem to have died off a wee bit. So when you wake up tomorrow morning after this podcast goes out, would you like to see just someone slither through? Uh, of course, you always want new signings, but the business we've done so far has been brilliant. I think see if Rangers hadn't signed Aaron Ramsey I'd be absolutely delighted with this window but that <laughs> yeah. wee last minute things got me a wee bit wary because I think he could be a good player but from a Celtic point of view I think the five players we brought in four of them will make significant contributions to the first team we've got them in nice and early something we've always wanted the squad is too bloated it doesn't look like the likes of Bologoli Soro Ayeti and Barkas are going to go Uragidi's out the door so far in Montgomery maybe but they've barely played to be honest or made significant impact so squad's looking better than it came into it we needed a few things I think we've we've got them it will just be a couple of weeks before we really see it come to fruition so happy with the business would have liked something but it's not a major deal for me yeah I think it's that it goes for me Stephen I think I read today that we were hoping to offload a Yeti back to Basel but they couldn't pay his wages or they couldn't match the wages. <laughs> they, could, they couldn't be bothered, is what, is what you're saying here. They didn't want to. I, I don't, we hoped to offload him. Basel said look, no. I know Switzerland. No no much money sloshing about there. Um, <laughs> so whatever we're paying, whatever we're paying Albi Nayeti, he cannot get that money in Switzerland of all places. Yeah. So I wonder how much wages he's getting. But yeah, I think it's the outgoings for me. You, I see Uruguide, he went on loan to a club in Belgium just as we were sitting down to record here. Um, I just, I think, yeah, the squad bloatedness is something that we need to look at. A lot of big players that we don't even need to mention them. Everyone knows who we're talking about that I'd like to see go. But apart from that, I'm very happy with the business. Yeah, I, I can't disagree with that. The the squad size needs addressed. It is far too big. We simply can't afford to carry the sheer volume, the sheer weight of the passengers mm. That are, that are currently on the train here so something needs done about it it's just a shame couldn't really address it in January but it is it's difficult to move players on especially if there's no interest in them yes. that, that's the first thing yeah. that's the key thing if no one wants to buy your tat it's, it's going to be very difficult to shift them but just hope it can be better done in summer because it's not good for anyone having these no. uh, these duds just hanging about absolutely hoovering up wages so no, let's let's just hope that's addressed. And that is as covered the news of the week as far as Celtic current affairs go. But it would be stupid of us, frankly, to end this podcast without mentioning the passing of Wim Janssen. Uh, for us guys, guys of our age, an iconic Celtic manager. Yeah, definitely. The, the first guy that won the league for Celtic in my lifetime. Mm-hmm. A long time coming and managed to stop the all-important one. I still remember where I was when we won that league. The guy came in just sort of unknown to me and unknown to people as well and just get absolutely pounded. Didn't let it affect him. Came in, done his job and managed to wrestle that title back. Won the League Cup, won the league, stopped the 10 and brought the King all in one season. And he's a legend for that for me. Like It's not usual that some guy comes for such little time at Celtic and makes such a big, such a big impact, but... Wim Janssen done that. Yeah, terribly sad. Uh, obviously in great 20-minute Tim's fashion, big and or sad news always drops immediately after we mm. are done recording the previous episode. So the news started coming through the next day. And when I, I, I found out that I knew he was ill for quite some time anyway, but I, it was still a shock to get the news. And I was thinking about it and it, was, it suddenly dawned on me that basically four of my lifetime managers I bet I kind of scraped in at the end of Billy McNeil. My first game was under Billy McNeil. So the four of the managers from my lifetime have, have now died and three of which were in the last two or three years. So that whole chunk from between the terrible 90s time right up to John Barnes, all of the managers have now have now are now sadly no longer with us. So yeah, it was it was a bit of a shock to hear. So Melly's already said did two things that changed the course of Celtic's history forever. One was 
And you know, it's often called stop in the 10, but let's not forget he won the double. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's often it's quite reductive to do, simply refer to it as just stopping the ten because the, oh there is that obsession with the ten and all that and it was massive at the time I was at the game I was I was at most of the games that season it was before I had a season ticket but I used to go along and spend quite a lot of time in the temporary stand and all that and I I, I remember exactly where I was sitting for the St Johnson game but um, won the double that season crucially stopped in the 10 and also brought Henrik Larson to the club so he alone altered the course of Celtic's history indelibly so thanks for the memories Vim uh, it was a great period of Celtic supporting uh, life for me because that was run about the time where Tommy Burns was the first manager that I just started to go away from my family like not going with my dad and my granddad anymore I was starting to go with my pal so it becomes a different thing for you it becomes this kind of ritual for you so I was that was right about the time where I started going to that so thanks for the memories Vim much appreciated and you'll be sadly missed thanks for listening <laughs>